Long before becoming a congressman from Ohio's 4th District, Congressman Jim Jordan spent most of his time in high school and college establishing a truly epic wrestling career, including being a four-time state champion and two-time NCAA Division I champion. Though he may not have realized it then, he was setting up for a lifetime of sports references and puns that would follow him as he wrestled to establish principles and pin down good legislation. <laughs> Got like 10 more of those. I'm going to leave them there. <laughs> uh, since his in initial election into Congress in 2006, Congressman Jordan has been the chair of the Republican Study Committee, a founding member and current chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, the sponsor of legislation to appoint a special prosecutor for the IRS targeting of conservative organizations, a nominee to become Speaker of the House, and is the currently the longest serving uh, current member of Congress with 100% lifetime rating from the American Conservative Union. Congressman Jordan has been called many things, legislator of the year, watchdog of the treasury, friend of the taxpayer, and defender of life. But today we are honored to call him our speaker. Congressman. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Peter, and thank, uh, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, there are people in public life who you wish were not. Most, most of them are Democrats and liberals. And then there, are, um, then there are people like Morton Blackwell who you are glad chose to be involved in, in public affairs. And the difference he has made and all of you have made in young people's lives and therefore the country is so appreciated. So thank you very much for the huge impact you've had since 1979 in um, helping keep the country focused on the values and principles that made us great in the first place. Uh, I'm going to just have a few remarks, and then uh, I tell every single audience I get the opportunity to speak to that um, in spite of the Obama administration, we still have this wonderful thing called the First Amendment, and you'll be able to exercise your First Amendment rights here in just a few minutes. And I tell everyone, even though you're not stuck in the wonderful Fourth District of Ohio, you all still pay my salary. And you can ask any question you want, and you can yell at me, and that's the way it's supposed to work in this this great country. I'm going to start with a story I've been sharing a lot because I think it captures the typical family today in the, in, in, in the country, I think, is fed up with his town. They can't stand this town. They don't think anybody here is fighting for them. And I want you to think of a scenario that's going to play out today all across the country. There's going to be a guy who works second shift at the local auto plant who's going to go out and get in his truck and drive to work. Now, remember, he works second shift which means he misses some of his kids' Little League games in the summer and some of his children's after-school activities. He's working second, like my dad had to work second shift for a little bit. When you're a kid, you hate when your dad does that. Um, but he's working hard for his family. He goes out to get in his truck to drive to work. As he's getting in his truck, he looks two houses down. He sees a guy sitting on the front porch, drinking a cup of coffee, reading the paper. The second shift worker knows the front porch sitter can work but won't work and is getting his tax dollars. Gets in his truck to drive to work, he happens to turn the radio on, it's the news hour, the reporter comes on, talks about the federal government has an $18 trillion debt. They got this program that gives money to favored corporations. This one company went bankrupt, cost the taxpayers millions of dollars. He hears all that, he remembers the guy back on the front porch, and guess what? This guy's ticked off, and he has every right to be. Same time he's driving to work, there's a lady driving home from work, this lady, second grade teacher at the local elementary school, she, like all good teachers, views her job as a mission field. She has worked her tail off all day long helping her students get the skills they need to help them get on the path to achieving success in America. She's worked hard all day long. She's driving home from work. She happens to have her radio on, happens to be on the same station, hears the same reporter come on and talk about the federal government with an $18 trillion national debt program that gives money to favored corporations and this one company went bankrupt and cost the taxpayers millions of dollars. She hears all that and remembers a bunch of other stupid things that's going on in Washington. She's thinking about all that as she pulls into her driveway, which happens to be on the same street, and she looks a couple houses away and sees that same guy sitting on the front porch drinking his coffee, reading the paper. She knows he can work but won't work and is getting her money. And guess what? She's ticked off too, and she has every right to be. Now, I would argue that so many of those second grade teachers and second shift workers 
in the last election, a bunch of them just stayed home. They said to heck with it. We know Washington's completely forgotten us. We know no one's fighting for the values and the principles and things that we care about and things that are going to help our family. But, us, but there were some of those families who said, you know what, I'm going to go vote. I am going to vote. And I think most of them said this. I think they said, we know the Democrat Party has forgotten us. We know they don't care about us. They're big government, special interests, giving our money to folks who, don't, who can work but won't work, and cozying up to you know, special interests who, who get close with government and special deals. We know they've forgotten us. We suspect the Republicans have too, but we're going to give them one more chance. We're going to give them one more opportunity and see if they actually are going to fight for things we care about. And so we had this election. Republicans took back the Senate. In the House, we have the highest number of Republicans in the House that we've had in 80-some years. And now it's crunch time where we have to demonstrate that we are actually standing up and fighting for regular families across this country. And I would argue that there are three things we have to do, and frankly, I don't know that we're demonstrating that very well right now. And the time's getting short because, let's be honest, if we don't show regular normal families across this country that we're fighting for them, I think more of them stay home next election, and that means Hillary Clinton's the next president, and this attack on liberty just continues to get worse and worse. That's really what's at stake. So I would argue just three quick things we can do, and then I want to talk about why it's so important we get this done. First, stop the corporate welfare. People are fed up with the coziness and the, the companies who get special deals at the expense of regular taxpayers and regular families. And we have a great example. It's what I've been spending a lot of my time on, and, and the House Freedom Caucus has been focused on as an objective. But it is what I would call – well, let me, let me back up a second. Y'all remember when we had this earmark debate here in this town a few years ago? And everyone said, oh, we can't get rid of earmarks. Never, never is going to happen. It's a way of life in Washington. And then along come this one earmark called the Bridge to Nowhere. You remember that one? Yeah. yeah. And suddenly that became the impetus and the catalyst for making this huge change and helping the taxpayers and treating the taxpayers with the respect they deserve. I would argue the Export-Import Bank is the Bridge to Nowhere of corporate welfare. It's the first step. If we can get rid of this Export-Import Bank and demonstrate to families that, look, the Republican Congress took a step towards, a big step towards dealing with this corporate welfare problem, I think that will go a long way in communicating to voters we're fighting for them. And understand with the Export-Import Bank, every single Republican candidate who's announced is against it except one. Lindsey Graham's the only one who's for it. But everyone else is against it. Rick Perry come out against it. John Casey come out against it. Rubio, Paul, Walker, Bush, they're all against it. The chairman of, of real um, importance on this issue, Chairman Ryan, Chairman Hensling, Chairman Price are all against it. Every conservative group in the country is opposed to it. At the bank, we have – a year ago, we had a hearing in the subcommittee I get the privilege of chairing where Johnny Gutierrez, who worked – used to work at the Export-Import Bank, came in and took the Fifth Amendment. Six weeks ago, he was indicted. Five weeks ago, he pled guilty to bribery and fraud charges. That took place over a seven-year time span at the bank. When the Inspector General was in front of our committee six weeks ago, I asked him the question, can we expect uh, – can you assure us there's not going to be any more indictments? He said, I can't, I can't do that. There may be more indictments in the Gutierrez case, and there may be indictments coming in the 31 open fraud investigations – that the Justice Department and the Inspector General are looking into at the Export-Import Bank. You have all that. And oh, the other thing. This is one time where Congress can do what it does best and we can get rid of the bank, which is nothing, right? Because we have to affirmatively reauthorize this for it to continue. So this is one time where we can do nothing, something Congress is pretty good at, and we can actually take a big step towards ending corporate welfare. You do that, say we're Showing that, then you have, I think, a greater moral platform to go after the social safety net programs that we have, the 79 different means-tested social welfare programs we have in this country that I think do a lot more trapping people into a lifestyle than they do in actually helping people get to a better, better station and better position in life. So then we have the, the, uh, the, the platform, I think, to focus on the work component that's needed in all these social welfare programs, if you're going to get taxpayer money and you're an able-bodied adult, there should be some work component if you're going to receive those dollars. 
and really focus on that. And this is one thing I think, a little aside here, that we're starting to lose in this country. America has always been the place where you work, right? Just Americans, when you think about America, we work compared to other countries, and we're starting to see some changes in our culture that I think are not positive in that, in that, in that uh, regard. I did this with an audience not too long ago. How, I, I want you all to think about, um, think about the first job you had, the very first job where you were making less than minimum wage. Maybe you were a babysitter or a waiter or waitress or delivering the papers or whatever. For my brother and I, we, um, we had a little lawn mowing business. We lived in west central Ohio out in the country. We mowed 20 different country lawns. And... Um, Think about the things you learned in those, those first jobs. I, 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 I tell folks, we, you, know, you, you learn to schedule. You learn to manage resources. My dad, we had this, he gave us this old beat-up truck. We had a trailer, a riding mower, push mower, weed eater, toolbox, gas cans. We looked like the Beverly Hillbillies going down the road. And he said, I'll get you started, but then you're, you're paying for the gas in the truck, the gas in the mowers. You gotta, you're screwing around and you break belts or pulleys or something. You're going to have to fix it. So you learn to manage things. You learn to schedule. We, 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 we found out that some people liked their yard mowed on Thursday because they wanted it looking nice for the weekend, and they would pay a little more money if you mowed it on Thursday. So guess what? We figured out a way to get those people mowed on Thursday. We weren't, you know, we were country boys, but we weren't stupid, right? <laughs> and um, you learned that the, probably the biggest thing you learn in those, those first experiences is you learn to deal with people, right? We, you just, you, 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 people skills, personal skills. We had, uh, I always remember the Steinberger sisters were two older ladies who never married. Wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, typically, you pull into a, to a place and you just get after. You jump out and start unloading, get mowing because you had things to do and we had practice to get to and everything else. And, but we quickly learned with the Steinberger sisters, it was worth your while to, before you started, to... Um, Go up, knock on the door, say hello, and talk to them for a few minutes. Because if you did that, about the time you're finishing up, trimming around the house, you could smell the chocolate chip cookies that they were making for you. <laughs> but here's what we're doing in America today. We are robbing people with this, the goofy social welfare programs we have that discourage and de-emphasize work. We are robbing people of learning that skill set that we all got in the very first job. And it's it's... Is just flat out wrong. It's 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 not fair to the people in, trapped in those programs, and it's not fair to the taxpayers who are paying for them. And it's something that we should change. And then the third thing we should do is just be bold. This this is this is something that Republicans can't be afraid of standing up for Republicans and for Republican principles. This is we're Republicans. I, I believe in certain conservative principles, and I'm not afraid to debate them. And I'll take on any Democrat or any liberal who wants to talk about them. I think we got the truth on our side, and if we can can present it in a compelling and articulate way, I think we win the debate. So let's not be afraid of that. Let's just be, let's be, let's just be bold. And, and the best example is, probably one of the best examples is, is just the tax system. Someone asked about that earlier when I was walking around. Everyone knows our tax code is completely broken. It is a complete joke, right? We all know this. I mean, I've said this many times, but think about any tax code on the personal side which says to half the population, you don't have to participate in the main tax, the income tax. Any tax code that says half the population does not even participate in the main tax is broken. And then on the corporate side, any tax code that says American company is going to pay the highest rate in the world is stupid. So if you have a tax code that's both broken and stupid, maybe you want to change it, right? So let's, let's just be bold. And, and if, you're not, if you're not bold and somewhat radical in what you propose – no one pays attention. Do, do some of you know that the former chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the last Congress, Mr. Camp, good guy, but he introduced the tax reform bill. Does anyone have any idea what was in that tax reform bill? Because it didn't get any attention because it just kind of shifted things around and was sort of the tinkering with basically the current code. Be bold. Go to a flat tax on the personal side, on the corporate side. Instead of just going to 25%, which everyone talks about, which would put us in the average corporate rate, go to the lowest. Go to 5%, zero. Go to – give something real. Make us – why not make America the lowest corporate rate in the world? For most of our history, companies wanted to headquarter here, 
And in the last six years of the Obama administration, we have this inversion issue where, you know, you have Burger King and, and Tim Hortons and people wanting to headquarter in other countries because we have a crazy corporate tax code. So be bold. Here's why it's important. We're bold enough. We deal with the corporate welfare problem. We have the right kind of approach to helping people in our social safety net systems. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's why it's so important. Because liberty has never been under more attack than it is today. And you can pick your issue. I thought it was interesting yesterday. I was sharing this with someone this morning as well. We had a hearing yesterday in the Oversight Committee where, now think about this, the press, five members of the press, from, from Cheryl Atkinson to uh, the guy at Vice uh, uh, Magazine to uh, someone from the New York Times, uh, someone from, I think the fourth person was AP, None of these people had ever testified in front of Congress before on, on the lack of response they're getting on FOIA requests, freedom of information requests. And yet, when the press feels like it's so important that they have to come testify, the press, in front of Congress about restrictions placed on the press, that tells you how bad it's gotten. And that's in, you know, that's in, so, as I said in, in, in the hearing, you have agencies that aren't complying with FOIA requests in the way they should, giving taxpayers and citizens the information that they're rightfully entitled to. But it's worse than that. Some of the same agencies that won't give you information also targeted people for exercising your most fundamental rights. Something Morton and I have talked a lot about. We're looking in this whole audit issue as well. But think about what happened with, and I'll, I'll just use the one example that I've spent a lot of time on the last two years. And that's getting to the bottom of the Internal Revenue Service targeting people. Now think about this. When you think about the First Amendment, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, but what's your most fundamental right under the First Amendment? Your right to do what? Yeah, do what I'm doing this morning. Speak. And not just any speech. When the founders put the First Amendment together, the most important aspect of your free speech rights was political speech, to speak in a political nature, political fashion against your government and not be harassed for doing so. And yet that's exactly in a systematic and sustained way that the uh, IRS, that's what they targeted. It doesn't get any more wrong than that. So if we don't present a bold vision that attracts people, inspires people, persuades them to go vote for Republicans, I think there's a good chance Hillary Clinton's the next president and all this attack on fundamental liberty continues to, to grow. So that's what's at stake and that's why that's why it's so critical, and that's why what you're all doing and supporting this fine organization is so important. Um, last thing I'd say is this. Uh, in spite of all that, in spite of the government that I think is religious freedom is under attack, um, your First Amendment free speech rights, this whole NSA issue, and your Fourth Amendment liberties, I think, are compromised as well. In spite of all that, it's still the best country going. And um, with a lot of good folks, a lot of good families who understand what made the country special in the first place. We have um, one of the neat things you get to do as a member of Congress is you nominate young people to go to our service academies. In our office, like a lot, we have a board who screens and interviews and goes to this, young people go through this process. And then what happens is when you nominate them, they go to the academies, and the academies then make the final up or down selection. And what the academies will typically do is um, they will contact our office and they let us give the good news before they send out the letter saying, Mr. Smith, you're now going to the West Point or the Naval Academy or, <coughs> excuse me, the Air Force Academy. So when we get the, we, when we get the, the notice from whatever academy, then I get on the phone and call these people and give them the good news. Well, I, I was actually in the O'Hare Airport back this winter and um, our chief of staff had sent me an email saying, uh, Sam Heingardner, a kid from Wapakoneta, Ohio, is uh, going to be getting his letter from the Air Force Academy, and so I should call the Heingardner family. And I was like, oh, they're fun calls to make. I, I actually remember the very first one I made eight years ago. I called this other, this young, I can't remember this young man's name, but I, I think it's Joe. I said, Joe, this is Congressman Jordan. You're going to get to go to United States Military Academy. And all you heard on the other end of the line was, <laughs> it was just one of those. 
It was like the first call I ever made on, on one of these. But this, this call, just this past one, I called, I called the Heingartner family, and uh, uh, Sam's mother, Suzanne, answered uh, the phone. I said, uh, Suzanne, is Congressman Jordan, is, is, is Sam available? And she said, yeah. And so Sam gets on there. I said, Sam, that just want to let you know that you'll be getting a letter from the Air Force Academy to let you know that you've been accepted and you're going to get to go to the United States Air Force Academy. He says, well, Congressman, we already got it. I said, oh, well, darn, you know, normally I beat the letter. I said, but congratulations, that's quite an honor. If there's any way our office can be helpful in the final, final things that have to be done, you know, don't hesitate to, to contact us. I said, can you put your mom, uh, Suzanne, back on the line? And she gets back on. I said, I just want to congratulate you as well. This is, this is a family, something you obviously should be very proud of. And, and um, I said, so congratulations. I said, is your husband, Ernest, is he, is he um, available? She says, no, he's not. He, um, he's not. He's not home right now. He, he had to step out and... Back later, she said, but I just want you to know, Congressman, I've seen my husband cry twice in his life, the day Sam and his twin brother were born, and today when we got this letter. And it made me think there are some great families in this country who believe in the values that made us special in the first place. And it's our job as people who are involved in politics to think about those people and what they mean and what this country is so, why this country is so special and be willing to fight for the things that matter. And if you think about that and think about families like, like the Heingartner family, I think we'll, we'll do the right thing. Last thing I'd say is this. Remember the history of this country. We have always been able to overcome whatever obstacle, whatever problem, whatever burden is in our path. We have always been able to do it. It's an amazing place. And I may have shared this the last time I was with you, but this is something that stuck with me. Two summers ago, and I will stop here and take your question. Two summers ago, we, um, we live north of Dayton, Ohio, and uh, we have some friends in the Dayton area who called us up and said, we want to go to dinner, and they, and they said, but before we go to dinner, we're going to tour the Wright Brothers' home. And uh, Polly and I said, yeah, we'd love to do, love to do both. We, we, the house we live in is, was built in 1837, so we like old things, and you know, they're, they're neat. It always costs money. They're always something you got to spend on to fix these things up, but... But we like that, and we said, sure, sure, we'll go, we'll go. So we, we go down there, we meet, the, meet our friends, and then we do the tour, and it's about an hour and a half, and you learn all kinds of neat things about this, these two brothers, amazing guys. I mean, typical American, entrepreneurial, innovative, I mean, just amazing guys. Um, and it's, you know, you historical society thing, and they take you through, and you learn about them. But what stuck with me is the last room they take you to. It's one of the, and I forget which brother it was, one of the brothers' bedrooms. And they're, they're talking about, you know, more information about the family. But in this last room, they show you two pictures. And the first picture they hold up, 1903, first flight, Kitty Hawk, in this contraption they called an airplane. It flew like 101 feet. And they hold it up, and you're like, well, I remember that from eighth grade, ninth grade, whenever you learn that in school. And you say, oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that's neat. They put that picture down. Next picture they hold up, 44 years later, Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier. Now think about it. In 1903, 1947, 44 years, two guys flying 100 feet to another American breaking the sound barrier. And I'm like, holy cow, I didn't know that. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. They put that down, that's it. Literally, that's it. And so I'm, I'm starting to walk out the door, and I'm like, well, for goodness sake, Why'd they stop there? I represent Wapakoneta, Ohio, where the Heingartner family's from. Where another Ohioan, uh, 22 years later, stepped on the moon. So think about this. In 66 years, two guys flying 101 feet on a beach in North Carolina, 66 years later, putting a guy on the moon? So when people tell me, you know, we can't deal with Barack Obama. I say, you're crazy? Think about this country, right? <laughs> Look what it's done in, in just 66 years. And if you remember that, that helps us have the boldness we need to have to energize and inspire people to fight for the things that really matter that will help put this country back on the right path. And never forget, when America leads, the world's safer and better. And if we're not leading... Someone who doesn't have the values, the heritage, the history, the principles will, will assume that leadership role, and the world gets even more scary and more dangerous than it already is. So 
God bless you. Thanks for coming out this morning, and thanks, most importantly, for helping this fine organization and all the great work it's doing. Someone's already got their hand up. So I think the gentleman back here, was a, he was putting his hand up even before I finished, uh, got close to finishing the last sentence. So you're first. And I don't know the time. Here's a... Thank you, Congressman. Oh, you uh, Preston Knoll with Tradition Family Property. Congressman, uh, you talked about bold ideas. I'm totally in favor of that, and I'd like to ask you for some, some insight in, on what kind of bold ideas you will be prepared, you are prepared to bring to the table for our country if the United States Supreme Court imposes same-sex marriage on us in a few weeks. If we take a look at what's happening in Canada, Catholics and others are being denied the ability to serve as lawyers and so on because powerful interests move to put them yeah. to, the, to, the, to the side like racists. What, we, what do you plan on doing if the Supreme Court does what we're afraid it's going to do? No, the main thing is you've got to speak out. You have to speak out and say, look, um, and, and it's something that scares me. Uh, I, I would argue two of, the, two of the things that probably scare me the most, and I, I gave a speech on this a, a week and a half ago. Uh, one is this idea in America now where we see – Instead of having the rule of law, we have um, the rule of bureaucrats, the rule of, of agencies, the rule of rules. So you, this, is where, this is where the EPA gets to um, say, no, the Clean Water Act doesn't mean what elected representatives in the United States Congress voted on it to mean. It now means that we're going to regulate whatever mud puddle and, and, and creek and stream that we can regulate. So you have agencies going away, and, and it, it, it's straight from the top. When, when the president can say Obamacare doesn't apply – uh, we're going to waive it for certain big corporations. We're going to waive it, and we're going to – when you have the president saying that we can do um, – even though 22 times I said I couldn't do it, I'm now going to do this executive amnesty. And So you have this abandoning the rule – diminishing the authority of the rule of law, and coupled with – and they sort of work together – coupled with a justice department that's more focused on politics than on administering justice. So – I would argue that the um, – well, here's a great example. Uh, because it made it easier for the left to do what they did to Mike Pence and the Indiana legislature relative to marriage and, 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 and religious liberty um, with their RIFRA uh, law, it, it was easier for the left to do that in Indiana a few months ago after the Justice Department – a few years ago, and didn't defend the Defense of Marriage Act, right? So that's what the, so, so those things are making. So all, our our focus is to speak out and speak the truth and say, look, marriage should be what it's always been. That served Western culture well, um, and frankly, there's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with government affirming the ideal and the ideal for bringing up the next generation of children is a mom and a dad and. We should be in favor of that, for goodness sake. That's good for a culture, good for a country, and not be afraid of it and, and be willing to just stand up and, and, again, in a compelling, articulate, and compassionate way, make that argument. That's what we got to do. It's not – no, I don't think there's any rocket science to it, uh, science, uh, science to it. just speak the truth. Uh, the, we'll go with the young lady, and then one will come here. I heard you in, when you were introduced as a fiscal conservative, and I hear a lot of talk um, in Congress about that issue and from the candidates. How do you balance fiscal conservatism with meeting the responsibilities to those in need in our society? And I'm particularly thinking of seniors um, in terms of health care rationing and in terms of diminishing their Social Security for those who have worked so hard and put away money? Yeah, well, uh, a couple things you have to do. One, start, fr start from the premise that Social Security, M Medicare, these are, these are promises the government's made with its citizens. We have to honor these promises. In order to do so, we're going to have to reform those systems, and we're going to have to get a handle on overall spending. We have offered plans that get us to balance – I mean – a few years ago, I offered the only balanced budget plan in Congress. Um, so we're going to have to have the discipline to control spending. But just as important is you have to create an environment conducive to economic growth. You can't just 
save your way and cut your way to balanced budget. You have to control spending, get yourself on a path to balance, but also create an environment that's going to grow, that's going to allow economic growth to happen. Uh, by way of comparison, you know, this last quarter, what were we, 0.7% to <clears throat> 1% .7 growth rate, which is pretty pathetic. Contrast that to 1985, the first year of Reagan's second term. And you know what the growth rate was then? 7.5%. You're growing at 7.5%. It gets a lot easier to deal with long-term concerns in Social Security and Medicare. Um, it, it, growth helps everybody. This is something Kemp understood, Reagan understood. It, it helped. So instead of having the goofy tax code I talk about, create a tax code that's, that's, that's conducive to growth. Um, create a regulatory environment that is going to promote economic growth. Um, get rid of Obamacare, which is a huge drag on economic growth right now. Any employer, I, I talk to employers across our day, and we're, the, we're a, I get the privilege of representing a great part of Ohio. We think all of Ohio is great, but I represent west central, north central part of the state. Honda's headquartered in our district, Scott's Lawn Care, uh, Whirlpool. To the largest dryer making facility in the world is in our district, and, and we got Procter and Gamble. I mean, we got amazing companies and all the suppliers and people who do the work there. And we're also the start of the ag belt. And agriculture's had like five of the best years in history of agriculture. So we're the start of the corn. It's good things happen in, in there. So you you have to help create an environment that doesn't overregulate those 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 and get Obamacare. You know, we got to get rid of Obamacare. Hopefully. The decision that comes down here in a few weeks will be the one we want relative to Obamacare. Let's do this, gentlemen, then I'll get to this side of the room. So I would try to be fair here and then cut me off. And, yeah. And i got to try to be out of here and by okay. 10 to 9 if I could. Uh, when you were talking about people starting their first job, it reminded me of a story that Hannity did about eight or nine months ago where you had oh. a, a father – um, encouraging his 11-year-old son to set up a lemonade stand yep. in his community. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, one of the neighbors complained to the regulatory authorities because the kid didn't have a license to run a business. Yeah. This meant that the father had to take time off of work, pull the kid out of school, go to court, and uh, get the thing basically dismissed. The judge, yeah. of course, got incensed and said, how dare this come before my court? We want to encourage kids to be responsible. Yeah, that's crazy. And... Luckily, the media got on onto this, and people started to come from all over to support the kid and buy his lemonade. Yeah. And people started calling the neighbor and telling him where to go for yeah. putting this family through this. It's great for that kid's business, wasn't it? It, it yeah. was. <laughs> but w what is the mindset of people that they would do something like this to an 11-year-old kid, you know, and put the family through something like that? I mean, the, there's something wrong in this country where – a neighbor would do, would do something like that. Yeah, and, and it's it's. And uh, I mean, do you have any thoughts or what? Sometimes I, I mean, I guess in just a general sense, when when the bureaucratic state gets so big, so so um, so ingrained that you d there's this, uh, there's the danger of a mindset developing that oh, if it's not if the bureaucrats say the rules are such, then we got to you know even though it makes no common sense, and that's unfortunately I think where we're headed. It goes back to this what I talk about rule of rule versus rule of law. Um, you can't have all these this this cumbersome bureaucracy that runs things and actually assumes the the role that's supposed to be the lawmakers. And remember, the bureaucrats are unelected. You get a chance to throw me out every two years. That's a good thing, right? That's why the founders wanted the house. They said we want this one body to be the closest to the people. That's where we're going to give the people, we the people, a chance to pitch them out every two years. That is healthy because I got to pay attention to what the folks in the fourth district of Ohio think makes sense and what they want done for their selves, their family, their business. That's what, I mean, this is the wisdom of the founders was amazing. So uh, you want the power to reside in people. You have a direct say on whether they're in office or not, not some unelected bureaucrat who's writing all these rules. I'll take a couple from this side, then I'm going to have to go. Let's go to the gentleman here in the front row. And <clears throat> Hi, Carl. Carl Golovin. Uh, as we spoke before the meeting, I wanted to compliment you and the state of Ohio on your treasurer, Josh Mandel, oh, and yeah. his system uh, yeah. for making totally transparent to the public every penny spent by the state, ohiocheckbook.com. You can literally track all the contractors that are getting paid and yeah. carry out corruption. And I ask you, what's the potential for encouraging that at the federal level? And um, oh. also, 
What about a monetary reform? Uh, ending the Federal Reserve, bringing back an honest unit of account so kids mowing lawn, lawns can actually save Give. money instead of having their paper money lose value. Yeah, no, great point. Uh, sound, sound dollar would, would, would certainly be helpful. Um, I have a friend who says, you know, um, what if we had a floating hour, right? Or a, um, or a uh, variable, uh, you know, we had a, a fluctuating um, foot, right? How, how, you know, so a foot, foot tomorrow is only 11 inches, and then down the road it may be 13, but then it could go back to 10 inches. And, you know, wh what kind of world is that? You have a whole, then you'd have a whole market develop on currency or, or on, on, on the foot, just like we have with currency. It makes no sense. So it's supposed to be a unit of measure. It should be stable. It should be sound. It should be. Uh, the same tomorrow as it is today. So something we have to, I think, focus on. Reagan got it pretty right back in the 80s when he had uh, dealt with, it, uh, I think, did the, did the right kind of things at the Fed that, that, that helped in, uh, in that regard. So uh, we'll see. Josh is a friend of mine, uh, Josh Mandel. I think he's going to run for Senate again in 18, and um, we hope he wins. So uh, he's doing a lot of good things. All right, we'll go here, and then I'll get out of here if that's about right. What's the you may be able to take one more. I'm Ken okay. Feldman, Falls Church uh, GOP chair. Oh, God bless. I want to commend you for your staff. You have one of the best oh, operations, and it's due to your leadership. Uh, occasionally, I, I will notice that there's an outstanding staff. Oh, thank you. And you've got it right now. J.C. Watts of Oklahoma had an outstanding staff. Yep. Henry Hyde from my home state, Illinois had an outstanding staff. Oh, thank you. And thank you, and also thank you for allowing them to go on to bigger and better things. It makes your job harder cultivating, yeah. but we all benefit. Yeah, from well, thank you. well, thank you. I'll, I'll report two of them over here sticking their chest out right now as you're talking. <laughs> uh, but uh, our, it, it's not because of me. Uh, we, have, we have a great chief of staff who, um, who actually took a leave of absence and ran – Josh Mandel's Senate campaign, and in a very tough year, almost won, almost knocked off an incumbent senator in the tough state of Ohio, ran way ahead of Romney on, uh, or, or ran close to Romney in, in, um, in, in, the, um, uh, in that race. So uh, our chief of staff is, is tremendous. All right, we'll take one more. Let's go with the, this, this guy right here. One of these, or we can maybe take the two in the front row. I apologize for sticking with the front row here. The gentleman who is four years away from being 100. Is that right? Didn't you tell me that? You're 96? That's correct. All right, That's 96. Correct. All right. And I happen to know something about. Uh, I bet you know a lot about a, a lot of debt, things. A debt, national debt, almost as big as the 18 trillion that you told. Yeah. That's hidden in the Social Security Fund. How did it get there? Yeah. Well, there's a whole bunch of unfunded liability we have out there in, in, in a lot of things. It just, I think, underscores. Maybe Sure have. They should be given a, a charitable contribution for contributing by delaying it a few years. That fifteen trillion dollar debt that is in there that should be contributed. It's getting to me somehow. The point is Yeah. Now they, uh, recording is going in there, and they call it a reserve for 20 days. Yeah. But it has disappeared completely by us oldsters. I've yep. been 30 years on Social Security. Right. And I've gotten over five pounds my share. Understand. <laughs> <laughs> When you're 96, when you're 96, you can filibuster too, can't you? Well, the point is, can we make it uh, give a, a charitable contribution for contributing a year's uh, benefits and a year's taxes? Give them a little bit of charitable thing to build their. 
All right. Yeah. Well, well, we we appreciate it. And thank you for. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go to the slightly younger, but maybe by a year or two, the the young man beside you, and this will be the last one. <coughs> thank you. Um, Democrats have spent the year trying to regulate the internet. In nine days, net neutrality is taking effect. Six days after that, the FCC will vote to uh, subsidize it. Shortly after that, they probably will vote to tax it. Um, it brings to mind Ronald Reagan saying, "If." That, uh, on Democrats, <laughs> yeah. if it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. If it stops moving, subsidize yeah. it. Subsidize it. Yeah. They're doing all of those this year. Speaker Boehner could stop it by defunding it, but he doesn't like using the appropriations process to take care of these things. But it really is a, a, a threat in the long term because you have Secretary Kerry and President Obama talking about relinquishing U.S. control at the same time. Uh, congressional Republicans could stop it now, but Speaker Boehner probably doesn't want to go that route. Why is he so hesitant we, to take action? What, what are we – well, <clears throat> let me go back. You're, you're exactly right. Net, net neutrality is wrong, bad. We should, we should stop it. What we've done on the Oversight Committee has had hearings on it, and, and what we discovered in the hearings was – uh, they were going to go with this. This they were going to actually put forward a rule that was sort of a hybrid, and I'm forgetting the name of it now. That they that they called it the the compromise rule or whatever, and then suddenly uh, the White House comes to um, the, uh, the the regulators, and and when the White House pays them a visit, and suddenly everything changes, and they go to the full rule that they are now now proposing. We had a hearing on this uh, several months back when it, when it first came out. You're, you're exactly right. Our, our power in the legislative branch is uh, the power of oversight, draw attention to things, highlight things, show how stupid and wrong things are, and you slow them down with that. And so we've done a lot of that, and, I've, that, and I focus on that because I'm on the oversight committee. I'm on the Benghazi committee, and so you, 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 it's an important function of Congress. But the ultimate power is the one you cite, which is the power of the purse, and frankly, we need to exercise it more. Uh, and we need to do it smart, but um, the founders in their wisdom said – you know, they, they gave these sort of three basic powers to the legislative branch. You got the ultimate kind of is the one that we're, we're not going to do this, but the ultimate one is the impeachment power, the oversight power, and then the power of the purse. And they really envisioned the power of the purse to be the one that we use. You're, there's a story yesterday where we're threatening the State Department's budget. If they don't start giving us information about – we've requested documents now for two years – State Department relative to the Benghazi situation, uh, and we're still of the of the ten people who were the, the key players of the State Department. We've got like a fourth of the emails from Cheryl Mills, Miss Clinton's uh, chief of staff, former chief of staff, um, and all the others we haven't got any information. So you know, come on, get us. The, so we're 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 trying to use it some there, but you're exactly right. It's a power we have to use more, better, smarter more, when when we do it. But if we, if we give that up, then the executive branch is going to continue to run the show. So thank you, and thank you all very much. Have a great day.